Next speaker Thank you. is um, Marius Catalin uh, Jordan from Princeton University. And he is going to tell us, um, including his shark outfit, about sculpt sculpting new visual concepts into the human brain. So whenever you are ready, please take it away. Thanks, Megan. Uh, thanks, Xu Ying. Uh, all right. So today, um, I want to talk about how we can model, uh, track, and modify neural representations in the human brain in real time. And the idea is that learning something new requires changing your brain. Uh, and that typically occurs through you know, experience, or study, or instruction. But today, I'm going to show you a new way of acquiring conceptual knowledge by directly sculpting activity patterns in the human brain. Um, we're going to use fMRI, neurofeedback, machine learning, and a lot of patience. So, uh, sorry. Um, all right. So we can use your neural image to recover information about visual categories from patterns of activity throughout the brain. Uh, but it's only like us with correlational insight into how knowledge is organized. So we don't really understand which neural representations are sufficient for you perceiving there's a dog there or the, what changes need to happen for you to be able to learn that dogs are a category of things in the world. So after learning to group things into categories, um, items from the same category become more similar to one another neurally and more different from other categories. So now we hypothesize that we could leverage this exact same process using neurofeedback to come up with a fundamentally new way for humans to acquire conceptual knowledge. That is, if we sculpt patterns of activity in the brain that mirror those that we expect to arise, through learning of visual categories, we may lead to enhanced perception of these sort of neurally sculpted categories compared to similar not sculpted uh, categories in the brain. Uh, so this is what we're gonna try to do today. Um, and we're gonna do it using a method called neurofeedback. And this is a non-invasive method. And the basic idea is to show people an explicit measure of how their brain responds to something and encourage them to change that representation in their own brain through trial and error. So suppose our goal is to increase activity in this region over you see a puppy, and we're gonna tell you, look at the puppy and generate a mental state that will give you a reward. Now, when you're trying to do this mentally, we can measure whether your brain activity goes up, in which case we give you a reward, here's a dollar. Otherwise, we give you nothing or we take away a dollar depending on how mean we are. And so over time, we train you to change your own mental representation of something you're looking at without explicitly realizing it. Now in practice, visual categories respond to complex multivariate patterns over thousands of voxels in the brain, not just activity level. So we're gonna use a similar method, but have participants generate new patterns of activity in their brain, not just up or down regulate them. All right, so we're using your feedback to gain this causal access to the building blocks of visual categorization in the brain. And to do that, we took a set of objects that elicited distinguishable neural representations, and this is a cartoon, I'm gonna go into what the stimulus set was in a second. And we generated an arbitrary category boundary. And for each point in this space, we're gonna use neurofeedback, encourage it to move and create its own separate neural representation category away from that boundary. Now, the idea is that this training procedure causes neural representations to separate and group into distinct categories. Now, I'll show you evidence that they do. And if this separation is causally to the perceptual decision of which category this stimuli belongs to, then we could see the effects of our manipulation when comparing pre and post training perceptual measures. Now, ideally, we will create new perceptual categories where none existed before. All right. So there are four hurdles that we need to overcome for this technique to allow us causal access to subjective experience. We need to build a complex stimulus set where we can select arbitrary categories. We need to figure out what representation to change in the brain. We need to reliably measure and track the multidimensional neural representations we care about so we can change them. And we need to show the changes that we can do is translate into neural and behavioral effects at the other end. All right, so let's start with the stimulus set. We created this parametric space of artificial shapes by adding together multiple Fourier descriptors. And I'm happy to chat more about this procedure during the Q&A, but for our purposes, imagine that you start with a shape that becomes the center of the space, and then you create a 2D surface of shapes that vary parametrically with distance from that center. So any two adjacent shapes are very similar, but shapes farther apart are very different. And by choosing a diameter on this circle, we can generate an arbitrary category boundary, which we can then enhance and sculpt in the brain using neurofeedback, such that objects along the train direction are pulled apart neurally and potentially perceptually. All right, 
So we also verify that each direction in the space is perceived in a similar way using a standard psychology match the category to AFT uh, behavioral parameter. We generated psychometric curves for categorizing shapes along each direction in the space and verified that people didn't have any biases across any of these directions in the space that we created. All right. So next, we have to figure out how this shape is represented in the brain in order to manipulate. For each person, we ran two fMRI scans where we showed them shapes spanning the 2D space. And we were looking for brain regions where the parametric relationship that we observe in how the space is built mathematically and how the space is perceived behaviorally was mirrored also in neural similarity. And now this corresponds to an ideal similarity matrix that looks like this. And it's exactly what the neural data looks like across many brain regions. For example, in LO, which is object information, we have a 0.96 correlation between the ideal matrix and the one that we measure empirically. But since we have a good understanding of where in the brain this type of representation might be causally related to you perceiving something that's out there in the world, we use a searchlight to find all the brain regions in each participant that represent the shape space parametrically. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna target our neural feedback actively across all of these regions. So that if a particular category boundary is enhanced across all of them simultaneously. And that way, if any of these regions is causally related to perception, we maximize our chances to influence categorical perception after we train people. All right, so next we have to build a model of the multidimensional landscape of brain representations to nudge our objects towards specific categories or patterns in the space. Now, suppose that we have two categories and that they elicit overlapping distributions of neural activity when we measure them with fMRI. This is true for real world categories such as dogs and cats. It's also true for the artificial shapes that we have. So we model each category as a Gaussian distribution whose mean and covariance we can estimate from the same fMRI data that we used to find the parametric shape regions a couple of minutes ago with a searchlight. Now, in this example neural space, for objects that fall within that boundary, the unique distribution of a category, such as the red area for category one, we have a strong prediction that they'll be perceived as members of that category. And we can use our neural model then to estimate a category boundary in the space. And then our neurofeedback manipulation is to push a point in the space that people haven't seen before, uh, that we want to be perceived strongly as part of category one, away from that boundary in the correct direction as we defined it in the brain. All right. So in the scanner, we use the shape space itself as a neurofeedback. So during each trial, we select a shape from one side of the category boundary and we allow it to oscillate in a small neighborhood around that point of mathematical shape space. Now, since the space is parametric, this looks like a smooth motion or oscillation. So this is what the participants saw during training. Uh, while we're looking at the shapes, participants are instructed to generate a mental state that's, make, that's gonna make the shape reduce or stop its oscillation. That's it, that's all they have to do in the scan. Um, Unbeknownst to them, the oscillation is tied to the neural presentation of the shape. So every couple of seconds, we measure the representation of what they're looking at. We compare the brain model we built before they went in the scanner. And if that representation moves away from the boundary, then the oscillation radius is reduced. So this demo, it's pretty complicated, but it's kind of an example of putting all these pieces together and, and what happens during a neurofeedback trial that lasts about eight TRs or 16 seconds. And uh, in this demo, the participants actually make steady progress towards stopping the shape, which means they generate a category representation that we want. To test this hypothesis that we can change neural representation and influence perception, we put everything together into a 10-day experiment. We built a complex space and made sure people perceive it in an unbiased way. We found all the brain regions in that person that represented a space parametrically. We built a model of the space and used it to track and modify representations across six days of neurofeedback training. And on the last day, we tested what happened to perception of the shapes. To do this, we had to also develop an efficient computational infrastructure to handle all of this in two seconds. That was nine months of my life. All right, so now let's see what we made our participants see. First, we measured whether our neurofeedback training procedure was successful in changing the way the shapes are grouped in the brain. So we looked at the model luck likelihood ratio, which is a measure of category separation. Now, a positive number on this graph means that we achieved our goal of higher neural separation for the trained direction versus the untrained direction. And we see that for the majority of our participants, 
our procedure changed the way their brain represents the shapes they were looking at, and we had a relatively strong effect across our entire cohort. Now, we found that we changed the brain. We want to see if this translates into a change of how people perceive the shapes. We did this similarly to the shape space norming. We measured psychometric functions of how the shapes along each line are perceived before and after training. Now, our neural change is causally linked to perceptual change. Then we predict that after training, the slope for the untrained direction should stay about the same, but we should see a sharper slope in the trained direction as people are, should be able to better categorize things in that direction. And so here we're gonna look at the difference between the slopes and trained versus untrained. And again, a positive effect means that we've affected people's behavior. And we saw that in the majority of our participants, we could not only change how the shapes were represented in the brain, but also how they were perceived of participants afterward. When we look at the brain and behavior changes together, we see that the magnitude of the induced neuroplasticity and the perceptual outcome are correlated. So we have a positive linear relationship between the neural and perceptual change across our cohort. The more we were able to sculpt separate neural categories of shapes in people's brains, the more we were able to change how they categorically perceive those shapes at the end of the experiment. All right, so to put all this together, we built a complex set of visual objects that are perceived and represented in the brain in a continuous fashion. We developed a closed loop system that allows us to track and modify neural representations in the human brain in real time. And we have evidence that this process not only restructured participants' neural processing, but also altered their perception and subjective experience. So our work puts forward a few key advances here. First, we provide causal evidence that distributed patterns of fMRI activity in high-level cortex are sufficient for complex perception. We made people learn to group shapes into categories without teaching them anything explicitly, but by manipulating complex brain activity instead. And crucially, we showed that patterns like this in the brain cannot just be reinforced or suppressed, as shown by a lot of prior work, but are radically altered to process and sculpt new novel categories into the brain that did not previously exist there to begin with. And this ability to program new conceptual distinctions into the human brain, that which we apply to perception, has broad relevance to other domains, such as decision-making, memory, and motor control that are all involving changing these kinds of patterns whenever you learn something. Finally, our work provides a new potential avenue for clinical interventions that may help mitigate the effects of disorders that might impact the natural function of the brain, such as agnosias, depressions, or autism, or developing new uh, neuro rehabilitation uh, techniques that require fine-grained control over these patterns in the brain. And, Perhaps we can glimpse the distant possibility of one day maybe programming extensive knowledge or complex concepts into the brain directly, bypassing what we normally think of as experience and instruction. Um, all right, so to end, I wanna thank all my collaborators, uh, our funding and you for your attention. And if you want more details, check out our print print on bioarchive and send me an email or a DM on Twitter. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Catalina, for this amazing talk. You know, I love this work and I've seen you present this before mm -hmm. uh, in various versions and I just think it's fabulous. So we have time for um, a quick question, a couple quick questions. First, uh, Mohammed in our panel is asking, couldn't this be that the subjects are just modulating their attention to fit the feedback? So people are paying, um, modulating their attention. Um, well, people have to use potentially attention to particular features of the input to probably do this task, but it's unclear exactly how that would change um, their neural representation unless the patterns actually separate in the brain. So this is what we measure. Um, so it's, it's possible attentional modulation, top-down modulation is a mechanism by which you can achieve this. Um, but by itself, it wouldn't be enough unless that actually causes the patterns to separate, which we measure and enforce and, and sort of ask people to do. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's yeah, paying attention is important uh, to be able to even do this. Yes. Awesome. Um, and we have uh, time for one more quick question before we move on. Uh, Avital Hami in the, in the Q&A box is asking, well, first, cool project and costume. Um, any ideas which brain regions contributed most to the formation of new categories? This is a great question. And again, we targeted all of them, all those regions that I should use uh, um, simultaneously. 
We know that LO, at least the way uh, we defined our ROIs, plays a big role in this, but every person had um, usually a frontal patch, uh, prefrontal cortex patch, and also other patches that were variable across people, things like IPS, things like parahippocampal cortex, sometimes STS. And those were weaker in terms of primary representation, but they existed, and, and a lot of people had those, a lot of these different ones. Um, and it's, it's unclear from our data exactly which one contributed the most. Uh, but it's a really cool question to start answering in the future, um, to do targeted neurofeedback for some of these unions and see what can we affect and what we can't affect in terms of uh, neural representation and people's behavior. That's really, that would be really cool to do. Awesome. Um, well, I have lots of questions, but unfortunately we are out of time. So um, we'll thank Catalina uh, uh, once again for the fantastic talk, very exciting work, and we will move on to our last speaker of the session.